Welcome to ECE 442-542. I have to remember what class I'm teaching this semester. That's the digital controls class. And what I will do typically is we'll start with this being displayed on the board, some announcements, and then a list of goals. I'm not sure how long the list of goals will be. I guess it's it goes on for three more pages, so we'll get back to that. Not quite. But your first assignment is the passport, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Most of the material that will be distributed in this class will be available on D2L. We do not have a textbook per se that you had to purchase at the bookstore, and so I'm trying to find material that you can access via the web, and those links will be available via D2L. That's the idea. In the time between now and the next time we meet, which will be a week, we won't meet Monday as we would normally meet. This will be our first Monday not to meet. The next Monday we don't meet during spring break. So that's this is the only sort of holiday that we have. Whoops. You can be reading some chapter material found under Unit 0 preliminaries, which will be under the next subheading of overview of control. And there's three different sections of different books or chapters that I've put there. You don't have to read everything, but that gives you a different perspective. And I'm not going to go into really maybe the history of control, although this course now, the prerequisite is really only 320. That's a circuit theory or a linear circuits class. It's no longer 340 just 340, not 340A, and it's not 441A, 541A. It used to be, so we used to start at a different spot or location or level. We're not doing that now. Before we get too far into it, let me get you started doing something physical, and that's signing the appropriate sheet. If you are in 442, and you know you're in 442, look for attachment number two, as well as if you're in 542, you need to be signing attachment two. If you are wanting to add the class, then depending on whether or not we have seats available, you need to be signing attachment one. So there's going to be many, many pages floating around. Make sure you sign the right page and that will be either 542 or 442, depending on which class you are in. And attachment one is only if you want to add the class, if you know you are not yet in the class. So that's the first thing that we want to talk about. The next thing is the syllabus, just to give us to make sure we're on a the same page in terms of understanding. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Hal Tharp and I will be your lecturer or instructor for this class. It's digital control and my office hours right now I have a couple on Tuesday and Thursday from 11 to noon and then on Wednesday right now for a couple of hours from 2 to 4. That hopefully will give you some different options to catch up with me. As I was talking about before, we did not require a textbook, but there will be several sources that we will be drawing from. And if you want to obtain or acquire a conventional digital control text, there's a lot of them. There aren't that many that are real recent that I've listed four, maybe in sort of the order of level that you need to have as far as a background to use those for background material as we go through the course. If you want something, you might find an earlier edition or one of these somewhere on the web that you can purchase to follow along with the appropriate material. But I'll try to give you quite a bit of the material that you'll need for this class 
and the first three are actually available to you either via a PDF or online. You can read it online, you can download a PDF, or the Shams outline is available as an ebook if you're into the U of A library system. And we will be using all of those different sources. For example, the introduction or overview of control, you could read chapter one of the Shams outline, you could read chapter one of Ostrom and Murray. I may just be saying AM, I may be SC for Shams in the wiki book, I might just say WC. Not CW, but WC. CW, isn't that a station, a TV station? I don't want you watching television, I want you doing your homework. So I need to make sure we're doing, giving you the right signals. Speaking of signals, they better not mess them up this weekend, right? There's something happening, supposed to be the biggest Sunday on in sports for a while. Never mind. <laughs> Pardon? Yes, it's handball. Exams. We'll have three exams this semester in addition to the final. And homework, right now I'm thinking we might have about eight assignments. Your points in terms of how you will be scored at the end of the semester. Hopefully those add up properly. You'll want to make sure you're not over adding. The undergraduate students will get 10% of their grade from homework. The graduate students will get 10% of their grade from homework and the project. Does that make sense? Those three lines then you have to sort of pay attention to what category or class you are in and we'll talk about the project more as we go. The final exam, maybe you're not looking that far into the future, but that's the first day of finals, and it's at 6 o'clock on Friday, and that's May 9th. That's your first day of finals when we hit finals week. That will be 30% of your grade, and it will be comprehensive, the final, and the other three exams. We'll have two exams prior to spring break. That's the plan. Spring break is the week following exam number two, and then we'll have one more exam prior to the final exam in April. Hopefully that will work and you can plan your dates accordingly. We really are not missing too much, but because we are concentrated on Monday and Wednesday, we miss quite a bit right at the beginning of the semester by not having this Monday and not having next Monday. So we, in the first two weeks, are only going to see each other twice instead of potentially three or four times. Then there's a very brief outline of the content or the topics. We're going to start hopefully today with some modeling. How do we model these systems? And if we're dealing with discrete time systems, we're going to be talking about difference equations, not differential equations, but we will want to be comfortable with differential equations because we need to make sure that we can transition or move between differential equations, difference equations, and transfer functions in both the Laplace and the Z domain. And so this semester, we will be working with the Z transform if you haven't seen that before and maybe you haven't if you have not taken a DSP, a digital signal processing class. And so we can't assume that everyone has seen or performed. Did you do Z transforms in your discrete math class? I'm assuming you did not. I would guess that's not necessarily covered in the discrete math class. Then we will, we have all sorts of complex planes that we can be playing with. We have the S plane and the Z plane, and we want to be comfortable in those two settings and know what that means. If I said, where do your poles need to be for a system to be stable if we were talking about a continuous time system and we're in the complex S plane, where do your poles need to be? Do you remember? In the left half plane. 
and I may provide some of that information or material in a prerequisite slash review section on D2L. And so you can be studying up or reviewing that kind of information. Laplace transforms, I'm assuming you're experts with Laplace transforms, how to inverse Laplace transform, how to take a differential equation and put it into the frequency domain, generate a transfer function, then we'll go from there. And that's what we want to do both in the continuous time setting and in the discrete time setting and know how to go back and forth. Are there questions on the syllabus or the course, how it's structured or going to be run? And if I fall asleep, just wake me up, okay? One of the things, maybe if you traveled over the break, you had to worry about your passport. There's a passport to get into this class. It's really just a way for me to put a face and a name together to connect. And maybe if I get brave enough, try to pronounce your name. Meaning if you can give me your name and a pronunciation guide, I can maybe try to stumble through that. I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Or if you have a nickname or something that you prefer to be called, instead of maybe your given name is Adam Smith and you go by Jerry, then I need to know that your nickname is Jerry so that I don't call you Adam and upset you if you don't like to be called your given name. And your email, a photograph, I always say don't give me your elementary school picture because I don't yet have that milk carton technology to age progress you to the present day. Okay. And a lot of times I will find people that have now facial hair and in their picture they don't, so I'll have to do that coloring in, I guess, but that's, that's okay. <clears throat> then something to remember you by. Maybe the picture and the name aren't quite enough but maybe you do something that is somewhat unique to you. Maybe you like to, I don't know, play the violin while you're unicycling down Campbell. Please don't do that. That's not a very controlled environment since we're in digital control, right? Unless everybody was driving vehicles that were autonomously controlled, which is maybe what you will be doing when you graduate and designing these algorithms for those particular situations, then it might be okay to be driving on a unicycle on Campbell. Now I wouldn't trust the other drivers. Something unique or interesting about you, then I'm trying to put this in the form of a quiz on D2L. I'm not sure that's going to happen but take this quiz on another site and score yourself in terms of how you learn and report that on your passport. And I may have you sort of answer those quiz questions on D2L if I can get it in the way that I want on D2L, but that's not yet available. And then answer the following question. What do you look forward to doing with your degree? Maybe you've spent six years getting your BS in ECE and now you say I'm going to paint sunsets. Maybe now you understand that sunset more with all its colors and the spectrum and you can but just let me know what it is that you are looking forward to doing with your degree. Questions on the passport. Again that's your passport into class there are a few empty seats if you want. You're not going to get filmed, but what does get filmed are these stick figures that I draw on the tablet. So there is, there are no cameras that are recording that I'm aware of, although you never know. So maybe you better watch what you're saying in this particular environment. Questions on the passport?
Again, there's the sign-up sheet. We've talked about the syllabus and the different textbooks and resources. Now let's look at some content. And in particular, why are we interested in digital control and start getting into some system modeling. And we'll start with hopefully something that you're somewhat comfortable with and progress into something that you maybe know, but maybe you haven't modeled it in that particular form as a difference equation. Let's get started then with this basic question. Why digital control? In the past, you would have all been very comfortable with me sketching the following diagrams. Here's G of S, and I would label this as the system. And sometimes I might refer to that as the plant. It is green, but it's not leafy. So it's a plant that's not a flowering system, that's just what the control community calls dynamical systems that we might be interested in controlling, a plant or a system. That's now G of S. That might be an automobile, which it might be the suspension system in an automobile. It might be the engine control. It might be a, the dynamics of an airplane. It might be a thermal system, it could be also it could be an electrical circuit, it could be a switched power supply, or maybe just a linear power supply, if we're now talking about it in terms of a transfer function G of S. You should have maybe seen some of these kinds of ideas before, I'm hoping. Even in 320, you learned about filters and you ended up with a G of S. So think of that as what you start with as a system then maybe it's not doing quite what you want it to do, or maybe there's a lot of variation in the system parameters. And for that reason, you might want to introduce, or maybe it already exists, there's a controller that you now introduce into that system as a sort of a preliminary processing of a signal where that signal is now an air signal, I might call that little E of S, that compares a reference input, R of S, with where the system is actually moving or going. It makes that comparison, generates an air signal. The air signal drives this controller, and the controller drives the transfer function or the plant to produce an output that you like. If that G of S was a robot and you commanded that robot with this reference input R of S, maybe you tell that robot to go to from A to B. Well, G of S just by itself might, the robot might be very flexible. You then design a controller to reduce that flexibility and now maybe it goes without much overshoot and without much ringing from point A to point B. And that's now what has been designed or produced. This is what we would call an analog control system. And you should have been playing a lot with this if you were taking 441 or 541. This should look very familiar to you if you haven't seen it. This is why you can start reading about control in those earlier books, just to get a feel for what it is that we might be using, or what is it that's sitting here in this block called G of S, which is our system or our plant. Now, one of the issues that we might be confronted with is D of S is our controller, and that's now some analog system, that could be just a bunch of interconnected op amps with R's and C's that do some filtering or adjusting of the air signal in the appropriate manner to drive our plant or system. But that D of S may be susceptible to different variations or different issues. 
it may be susceptible to, let's say, environmental conditions or maybe, well, the environmental conditions that you might be experience is maybe that particular set of electronics is very sensitive to temperature or it is sensitive to temperature or maybe it doesn't do so well in hostile humid environments or humidity might make it susceptible. Maybe Josie gave you 50% tolerant parts and now Oh, brother, now my part is not what I thought it was, and that makes my controlled system behave differently than what I wanted. So you might have some components that are varying, or those pieces may be aging. Or they may have this large tolerance that we maybe didn't design for. There might be noise coming into our system at any one of those interconnecting points between the different systems or even internal to the system or the transfer or the controller. Parameters may drift with time, maybe with temperature, maybe with humidity. Who knows why they are drifting? Maybe those parts are expensive and maybe they are unreliable. For one or many of those conditions, maybe you now have finished your education or maybe you're doing an internship this next summer and the boss says, I want to get rid of that D of S. I need you to put a computer in there or a microprocessor or a microcontroller. I need you to replace that analog set of electronics with something that we can program and code and plug that in and make it perform as well if not better than what the existing system is doing. Now what we want to do because D of S had all of these potential problems let's now replace that analog controller D of S with a di digital device, where that digital device, like I said, it might be a microprocessor, it might be a microcontroller, it might be a computer, it might be some digital signal processing chip. But now what we have is we not only have the system that we had before, that was this G of S, we have its output, Y of S, we are also commanding it the same as we were commanding it before. R of S is the same. We're comparing that R of S with the output just like before, but now what we are doing is we are introducing an analog to digital converter. We need to somehow sample that analog air signal. Here's our E of S that we did have. And now this goes through our system that we were using to implement that controller in a digital set sense, which might be this DSP, it might be a computer. That D sub D of Z is now a system that's processing these sequences of numbers. Now we've taken this analog signal and converted it into a sampled version through that A to D converter. We now have in the frequency domain the Z transform of that sequence of numbers. The controller now will produce another sequence of numbers and if this is a Let's say this is some kind of motor. Maybe it's a DC motor. Well, we can't just hit it with 
a number and then wait and hit it with a number, another number, we have to hit it with a continuous waveform. This sequence of numbers coming out then needs to be processed through a digital to analog converter so that now right here this U of S is consistent with what we had before. That digital to analog might be a zero order hold. This then is all going in to replace what we had previously had playing for D of S. Now we have a A to D, a D sub D of Z. This is all driven by some signal, some clock. And all of that now allows us to maybe more effectively control the original system or plant, G of S. And what we are worried about or interested in in this class is the stability of this overall picture, how to produce or create this capital D sub D of Z. That's what we're going to be doing in this class, really. This particular block diagram, relative to what we had before, we had an analog controlled system. Now we have a sample data system. We're now sampling the air signal with the A to D converter. We're then processing that sequence of numbers appropriately to produce the behavior that we want to have happen in the closed loop setting. That's one reason why we might be interested in the material that you'll be learning in this class, is how do we now, maybe your boss she says, oh, we have this analog controller and I need you to design a digital controller to replace that. And that's your assignment for the next month or the next two weeks, depending on how optimistic. Yeah, I had control with ARP. Oh, then you can do it in a week. <laughs> Who did you have, ARP? Hmm. Yeah, let's just stick with that first answer, okay? That's one way that you might be benefited by taking the material in this class. Another way is if we started with a system that was already digital in inherently, meaning we now have, instead of a G of S, maybe we actually have a system in the frequency domain that's now inherently digital or operating on a discrete time setting. Here's now our system. Now we're saying this is inherently a discrete time setting or system. And that might be your bank account. Every month you get a statement. And that you could model as a dis discrete time system. Or it might be a computer network where you now have a clock with your network and you're controlling the queues or the processing of information as it's going through your system. You now have modeled that as a G of Z and you need to control that in some way or some manner. It might be a switching power supply. It might be a radar system where you're seeing this blip every so often and you're now trying to manage that system. We now have a system that is happening as a sequence or as a discrete time system. Now we don't have to worry so much about sampling and doing this A to D and D to A conversion. Now we can directly design our controller, D of Z. Again, we might want to measure the output. Now we're talking about in the frequency domain, every signal is now a Z transformed signal. And now we have this reference inputs, Z transform, little r of Z or capital R of Z. And that's now driving this system. And if I don't label that, typically you can assume that that's a positive 
sign on that particular arrow going into that block diagram. So this is now a purely digital system and you will then in this class be able to figure out how do I create d sub d of z directly. And that might be based on satisfying certain time domain performance specification. Maybe you say, I need my overshoot. When I command this to go from A to B, maybe I want that robot arm to not overshoot more than 5% of the commanded location where I want it to go. Because maybe it's up against a wall. And if you go further than 5%, you've now hit a, made a hole in the wall. Hit it harder than that. Okay. So you need to make sure that you understand, and maybe you need to speed up your system, make it have a quicker or a faster time to its final destination. Maybe it's really slow, and now you design that controller to speed it up. There's all sorts of ways or reasons why you might want to control a system. There might be a lot of uncertainty in your system, and you want to minimize or reduce the impact of that uncertainty. You might want to change the dynamics of that system. Those are sort of the two big ideas with why you might want to build a controller and convert it. Now I've listed a G of S and a G of Z throughout, and I've mentioned something about systems. What we want to do is get very comfortable modeling those systems. In various domains, continuous time, discrete time, etc. Let's just look at that in general. And typically we aren't going to get into the nonlinear systems, we will assume we have a linear system. And a lot of times in this class, we're not going to spend too much time trying to derive that model, but when you get out in the real world, finding that G of S or getting that system may be 80% of the challenge. Once you have that G of S, then you can apply what we've learned in this class maybe very quickly to make the performance be what you need it to be for that particular system. Let's now just say that we will concentrate on linear models. Again, we will be looking at systems that are in the continuous time setting or that are, I'll just say, an analog system. Those might be in one of two different domains. It might be described or modeled in the time domain. Here we are talking about differential equations and those might be represented in a specific way or with a state space representation or we might be looking at this system, a analog system in the frequency domain and there we will be looking for the G of S, the capital G of S. As an example you might have this time domain as a second order differential equation. Maybe it's y double prime, those primes are the derivatives, plus 4y prime of t plus 13y of t is equal to, let's say, u of t. y of t would be our output, u of t would be the input. And if you don't feel comfortable yet, hopefully with a little bit of review, you'll remember that the transfer function 
is quickly found to be just 1 over s squared plus 4s plus 13 associated with that particular second order differential equation. And then you now know where the poles of that transfer function are. And you need to be comfortable going back and forth. And we'll work with that process. We very quickly went from time domain to frequency domain by Laplace transforming that differential equation. It might be a system of differential equations and evaluating for or finding this ratio of the output Laplace transform to the input Laplace transform to give us 1 over s squared plus 4s plus 13. Is that system stable? And if you've taken a 320 with me or maybe a 340, you know how to check stability of a second order polynomial or find the locations and that is if these two coefficients, the linear coefficient, the coefficient of s and the coefficient of s to the zero, if they are both present and positive, then if you actually found the roots of s squared plus 4s plus 13 in MATLAB or on your calculator or using the quadratic formula, you would find that that has roots at s equal minus 2 plus and minus j3. And the minus 2 is putting you in the left half plane of the s plane and that's where you want to be for that system to be stable. So if you hit this system with any kind of input that was bounded, it's going to give you a bounded y of t. It may not behave the way you want it to behave because you have some oscillation that you maybe don't like, but that's what we will worry about in this class. But that's then in the continuous time or analog setting of modeling this system. And we need to get comfortable with that process. Likewise, we have or can perform the same kind of analysis in the digital setting versus the analog. Now we have a digital setting or discrete time. Again, we can be in the time domain or the frequency domain. And in the time domain, again, we could possibly have that in the form of a state space representation. Now we might be having this difference equation that's y of n plus 2 minus 0 0.4 y of n plus 1 plus 0 0.4 y of n is equal to u of n. Now this y again is our output u is the input, but now this particular system evolves dynamically with this time index n. n might be the present time, n plus 1 is one sam time sample into the future, n plus 2 is two, times sam two sample periods into the future. And now you know how this input and output are related they will evolve dynamically by this difference equations relationship. We could then find this system's transfer function by actually consistent with what we did before in the differential equation, we took the Laplace transform, we will soon learn how to take the Z transform of this difference equation and produce a transfer function capital G of Z. This now is also this ratio of the Z transformed output over the Z transformed input and that gives us 1 over Z squared minus 0 0.1 or 0.4 Z plus 0 
and that's now our transfer function associated with a digital system. And we'll get more into that as we go. But we need to get comfortable with either starting with a differential equation and producing a capital G of Z, starting with a difference equation, coming up with a G of Z, maybe working with a G of S and finding a D of S, and then converting the D of S to a D of Z, or a D sub D of Z. All of those ideas we need to get comfortable with, and that's where we're headed in this particular course. Let me then just conclude by saying we need to learn how to convert between the different model representations. Maybe you had a nice relaxing break between semesters, so let's go back and review and get comfortable with some of these concepts with, I hope, an example or a system that you should be somewhat comfortable playing with. So let's look at this continuous time model, and I'm going to say this is a review. Maybe not all of this will be a review, but I hope that between now and next Wednesday, you'll have a chance to remind yourself of what needs to be reminded or how to review what you now need to review. Suppose we now have a circuit, since this is an ECE class, suppose now we have two resistors, R1 and R2, two capacitors, C1 and C2, and now this is where you might initially get confused. U of T does not necessarily mean the unit step. U of T now is just a generic signal, a generic input signal, and we may use that routinely. So in order to not be confused, please make sure that if that's indicated somewhere, is that the unit step? No, it's a generic waveform or a generic input signal, U of T. If we are now modeling this system, how did we go about modeling this system? What's the order of this system, or what do we expect it to be? How many equations, or this is a, will lead us to what kind of a system? A continuous time or a discrete time? Continuous, right? So we're starting with something I hope we're okay with. This is now going to produce maybe a collection of differential equations. How many, what's the order or how many differential equations would you expect? Two, right? Because we have two energy storage devices. We have two capacitors. We have two energy storage devices. We should expect a second order system that results from this. If we found the transfer function between the input U and some signal here that we called the output, that transfer function's denominator will be a second order polynomial in S. That's what we're expecting. Unless we have some cancellations, which could happen by the appropriate choice of R's and C's. Suppose that I now say I'm going to be interested in the voltage across that second capacitor, that's going to be my output, Y of T. How do I find a relationship that relates the input voltage U to the output voltage across that capacitor. What's the process? Do you remember? If I said 
state variables. Does that help you at all? What would your state variables be? What, what did we concentrate on when we were writing circuit equations? We, if we have energy storage devices, we have inductors and capacitors. What do we usually play with, with an inductor or a capacitor? And now what's the Eli and ice that I used to remind you about? Eli the ice man. If you remember Eli and ice, then you know V is equal to L di dt and I is equal to C dv dt. Those quantities that are being differentiated are the quantities of interest. Here we have capacitors. That's ice, isn't it? I is equal to C dv dt. Oh, dv dt. We must be interested in the voltages of those capacitors by the generic assignment. That means maybe we should be labeling there's one state variable and there's a second state variable. And what we might want to try to do then is write equations that will produce an x1 prime and an x2 prime in terms of x1, x2, and u. And then we'll try to write y in terms of x1, x2, and u. And then we'll be done. We will have a system of differential equations that will give us the behavior of this circuit. If we want equations, an x1 dot and an x2 dot, or an x1 prime and an x2 prime, and we know ice, i is equal to c dv dt, we can get a derivative if we differentiate this voltage. And if we had c1 dx1 dt, that's the current going down through that middle branch. Currents. Let's write some KCL equations. We can now write KCL equations for two different places, node 1 and node 2. If we write KCL at node 1, Again, this, I want you to start feeling warm and fuzzy. If this is making you your palms sweat or you get a little nervous, then that's what you have to do between now. And you have a holiday weekend to do this, right? You're not doing anything Sunday. There's nothing on TV. <clears throat> Except some handball or something somebody said. All right, so I don't know what channel you're watching, but... That doesn't sound like something I would be interested in watching. Handball. No. Node 1. Now, KCL at node 1, the sum of the currents algebraically at that node need to sum to 0. Or if we just say, let's sum all the currents out of that node and set that equal to 0, then we would be OK. The current going to the left out of node 1 is what? In terms of, and how do we want to write this? We want to write this in terms of x1s, x2s, and u. And not y. y is our output. We want to eventually write y in terms of x1, x2, and u. But to get the governing equations, let's just find some x1, x2s, and their derivatives, and u, and call it good. If I want this current going from right to left out of node 1, then I'm really asking for the voltage dropped across R1 and divide by R1, and that will give me that current. And the voltage dropped is simply X1 minus U. That's the voltage dropped from right to left across that resistor meaning I can now say x1 of t minus u of t over r1 is the current going from right to left. If I want this current going down, that's just ice, isn't it? That's c1 x1 prime of t. The current going from left to right out of node 1 
if I was happy with what I just wrote before, now I simply say, oh, that voltage dropped across that resistor is simply X1 minus X2 divide by R2. That's now the current going from left to right, and that's equal to zero. And now I have one equation in terms of the variables that I was happy with. A derivative of one of those, which is X1, and X1, X2, and U. And there are no Y's in there. That's good. That's one equation. It's a first order coupled differential equation. It's coupled because you're coupling X2 into the X1 prime equation. Questions on where that came from? Are we feeling warm and fuzzy? You can bring your... I better not say. I was going to say you can bring your blanket next time if you if that helps you feel warm and fuzzy. <clears throat> but hopefully you don't even need it. You just need this circuit, and that helps you feel warm and fuzzy. So now you can pull out a napkin, and you can start deriving all of these relationships when you leave here and start eating dinner, right? Somebody will go, hey, what would you learn today? Oh, let me show you. and they will just be eating it up. They'll just love it, right? Your art made your roommate. They'll love this. Now we need KCL at node 2. Now that we've seen it done once, we can do it for node 2 quite easily, I hope. We know the current going to the left from node 2 to node 1, that's X2 minus X1 over R2. Current going down, through that rightmost vertical branch is simply C2, X2 prime. Those two sum to zero. We now can say that we have, whatever I just said, X2 minus X1 of T over R sub 2 plus C sub 2, X2 prime of T equaling zero. And now we have two coupled first order differential equations, and that's what we were expecting to end up with for this circuit. And that's now a time domain system description for this system. If I said, what's the output equation? What's the output equation? Now I'm saying rewrite Y in terms of X1, X2, and U. And that one's so easy it may be hard. But Y is just X sub 2. That's our output. We now can say that if somebody wants the output, that's simply going to be X sub 2, and that is Y of T. That's now the relationship we need to find the dynamic behavior between the input voltage U and the output voltage across that second capacitor Y. If we do a little algebra with that, we can actually isolate X1 prime and X2 prime and put that into something that's very close to state space representation, a state space representation. And I'm just going to do that. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to isolate X1 prime and put it on the left side of the equality sign, meaning I'm going to divide everything by C1. This is the algebra. I had some middle schoolers last week, and I said, just learn your algebra. We're already in calculus. <laughs> oh, you're entering the seventh grade? Mm-hmm. Okay, do you know your algebra? Yeah, but I'm going to forget it by the time I get to be a freshman in, nah, just joking, but they seem to be okay with learning algebra. I think they were in algebra. They were eighth graders. What was I doing? <laughs> I was doing algebra, wasn't I? So now I need to find X1 prime an equation for that. And I want on the right-hand side only X1, X2s, and U. I don't want any derivatives over there. 
So I need to get rid of them if that were the case. But this is a pretty easy system to deal with. I'm going to divide by C1 everything and push everything else over to the other side. All of my X1 terms are going to have a minus sign. My X2 term, when I put it over on the right-hand side, that will have a plus sign. My input, the U term, will be a plus sign when I end up over on the right-hand side. So that now, if I looked at my X1 prime equation, I end up with minus 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2, and that was all divided by C1, and that's scaling X1 of T. I had a plus 1 over R sub 2 C1, X sub 2 of T, and a plus 1 over R1 C1, U of T. And that should just be screaming at you, I want to be in a state space representation, if you wanted to push it that way. X2 prime is easier just because we don't have as many terms. But if we did the same process, we would have 1 over R sub 2, C sub 2, X1 of T, minus 1 over R sub 2, C sub 2, x sub 2 of t. That's now just a rewritten version of those governing differential equations. And you should be comfortable with those. Now what we want to do is write this in or sketch this. This is why, you know, we shouldn't make fun. Because I told those middle schoolers, I said, you know, you have a fine arts requirement, you could take an art class. I said, because you need to be able to sketch all of your ideas, your answers. You need to be on a napkin or wherever. It might actually be a nice piece of paper, but you can now sketch. I said, I'm not very good at sketching. I could have benefited by paying attention in art class when I was your age. That's so long ago, there's no way I can catch up. But you guys still can, right? You can sketch and be neat about it. But let's now look at a block diagram. Boy, I don't know why I'm dealing with middle schoolers, but that's a challenge. Block diagram. And let's do it in the time domain. Now we have, and I might say, or you might read this, Somebody might say, oh, the all integrator block diagram. With these two equations in blue that I've now developed or obtained from that electric circuit, I can now integrate x1 prime and x2 prime to produce an x1 and an x2, and that's all I need to build up the right hand side. Meaning, what I'm going to do for a block diagram is I'm going to say, suppose I start with x1 prime of t, and I integrate it. This is why they were interested in the calculus, right? Now they can integrate. You can now put that in a block diagram. If I put x1 prime through an integrator, what's going to be the output of that integrator? x1. Well, if I now have x1, I just need to go back and say, oh, x1 prime is a scaled version of x1, and I now have x1 in my block diagram. I can introduce an input u and scale it by 1 over r1 c1. Those sum up to give me most of x1 prime. x1 prime, then, I'm going to create by summing up waveforms or signals, meaning I'm going to scale the input u of t with 1 over r1 c1. That's going to be making up part of x1 prime. Another part of x1 prime was a scaled version. 
I told you I should have had an art class. This is, well, now I'm going to have to pull that off. There's x1. That now scales that and goes up here. And I need one more piece, which is an x2 piece, but I'm going to produce x2 by integrating x2 prime through an integrator. And here is now x sub 2 of t. Once I have x sub 2 of t, I can go back and say, oh, I need to scale that by 1 over r2c1, add that in with these other two terms, and that's going to produce x1 prime. I come down, down here and I say, oh, let me pull that waveform and scale it by 1 over whatever I said, R2C1, is that what it was? Is X1 prime now correct? If I had X2, it's now three terms made up of X1, X2, scaled versions and u, that produces x1 prime. Now to produce x2 prime, I go back to the second equation and I say, oh, I need to scale x1 by 1 over r2c2 and I need to scale x2 by the same factor and add those in to produce x2 prime. And now I have an all integrator block diagram that's a block diagram realization of that electrical circuit. And in the old days, I had to go into the lab and put this on an analog computer. You guys have analog computers? Does Josie have an analog computer so you can play with? That's what we would do. We would scale signals, add in summing junctions, put in integrators, and now we could solve differential equations with an analog computer. And that's what you have here, is a way of solving. Now you can in introduce a signal, U of T, in this interconnected way, and out pops x sub 2 of t, which we know is the same or is equal to our output y of t in this particular block diagram, the way we, or this circuit or this system, the way that we model. That's now a block diagram representation of the, that, that electrical circuit. We started with an electrical circuit. We found differential equations, second order. We've now found a block diagram. So if you're more visual, and if this dynamic, these interconnected differential equations don't look the way you like to feel, now you can see them in a block diagram. And you can see how X1 and X2 are physically interconnected through a block diagram representation, or an all integrator block diagram. This is a time domain did I label that? This is a time domain block diagram. I could convert that into a frequency domain very easily by just saying, what does an integrator look like in the frequency domain? Do you remember? 1 over s. 1 over s is an integrator in the frequency domain. 1 over s could be representing either an operation or an operator or a signal. If it was a signal, 1 over s is what you obtained when you did what? Or what kind of a signal does 1 over s represent? If it's a signal, now it's like a step, isn't it? A constant. But if it's a system, then it's an integrator. So whatever it is depends on the context whatever 1 over s is. In this case, we want 1 over s to be an operation consistent with an integrator. Just like the inverse of that, s is a differentiation. And we usually don't like to differentiate because if we had a noisy signal and we differentiated it, 
It's going to get worse, isn't it? Let's now look at this block diagram then in the frequency domain. What I said is the structure is exactly the same, except now, wherever we had time domain integrators, now we have these operators in the frequency domain that are just 1 over s. But everything else around those blocks looks exactly the same. The coefficients are the same. The summing junctions are the same. But I'm going to get lazy and just label that coefficient as beta. But this is now not u of t. This is where I get angry at you. Now we're in the frequency domain. You need to be putting the arguments as s's, not time. This is now the Laplace transform of your reference signal. That's now u of s. Coming out of here is now capital X sub 2 of s, the Laplace transform of x little x sub 2 of t, or that's now capital Y of s. But now we have scaling going on. It's exactly the same. I'm just defining alpha sub 2, 2 to be a minus 1 over R2, C2. I'm just using alphas. Here, I'm going to call this an alpha 2, 1. And that's now going to be, in the frequency domain, the derivative of x sub 2. Then I simply have a couple of more blocks to add in. I have an alpha 1, 1 block. And an alpha 1, 2 block. And all of those signals have a positive labeling because I've absorbed the minus sign into my coefficients. That's now another block diagram in the frequency domain. And you might see this in a book somewhere. And what is this? Well, in this particular case, that's this circuit. This RC circuit is just now a block diagram in the S domain. Or somebody might say, oh, let's actually do the state space representation. Let's go back into the time domain. And now we can say, oh, x1 prime of t, x2 prime of t. We're going to stack those up. It's just a second order. So our vector of derivatives of the state is just TWO tall and 1 wide, x1 prime, x2 prime. It will then scale the state vector. And now we have alpha 1, 1, alpha 1, 2, alpha 2, 1, alpha 2, 2, plus beta 0 u of t. That's now our state space representation and our output equation, y of t, is some linear combination of the state vector plus the input. And what are the entries? in those matrices. And I've already given you the answer in terms of their dimensions. We only had one output, meaning these matrices are just one row tall. The output matrix between the state vector and the output is TW0 or TWO 2 wide. It's a 1 by 2 matrix. But what are these two entries and the third entry in the direct feed-through matrix. There was no input forcing the output directly, was there? There was no direct connection between the input U and the output Y. We didn't see in our block diagram there was no signal coming from here feeding over to there by a summing junction anyway. So let me get rid of that. 
That didn't exist. But what else do we have for Y? Y is hopefully not just nothing. The output is X2. So now I simply have to say, oh, that's a 0 and 1. I need to pull off X sub 2, and that's now my output equation. Meaning I can now say that this is my system matrix A. Here's my system matrix B. Here's my output matrix C. And here's my direct feed-through matrix D. That's another description of that electrical circuit, a state space representation. Again, maybe this is review, but I'm just trying to get us all up and running, starting to exercise properly. Stretch out before you exercise, so we're trying to go slow. Now we can get a transfer function. And let's just go ahead and find that algebraically from the state space representation. We could have found that from the block diagram. With block diagram algebra, I don't know if those middle schoolers were doing any block diagram algebra. They were doing the algebra part, but now you just have to apply that to a block diagram. Or you could use Mason's gain formula. How many have used Mason's gain formula before? Really? No one's used Mason's gain? No, there's no other name. Mason's gain. Wow. Okay, I'll put a review of that on the web, D2L, maybe. And we might talk about it. Because the nice thing is it carries over. If you've learned it for the analog setting, you can apply the same rules in the digital setting, it's just you need to keep track of your S's and your Z's. All right, before we do that, which we're not doing, we could have, we could have found this, could find from the block diagram. By that I mean we could go back here and you could find an equation relating Y of S to u of s, and that equation will give you the closed loop tra or the transfer function of that system. We're going to do it now that we have it in the state space setting. We are going to derive the transfer function in terms of capital A, capital B, capital C, and capital D. And here's something that can really throw you. D is not what we started the lecture with. Remember I said D of S was a controller? Now, by context, this D is not the same because this one's nothing, is it? This is just a label, so maybe I should call that D bar, but in the textbooks, this is just D. And this is the East Coast state space representation. There's a West Coast state space representation where this might be F, G, H and J, something like that. We'll stay on the East Coast, okay? Because then you have the confusion of this G, wait, is that the transfer? Fund? No, that's a matrix in the state space representation. Does everybody know how to get the state space or the transfer function from the state space? If you had, if you had 340 with me, you better. Yes? Uh, but maybe some of you were not fortunate enough or for depending on, don't answer that. <laughs> but what are we trying to do? Now we're trying to do, we're taking x dot, and now x is a vector. All of this is all by context, isn't it? So x is now tall and thin. x might be an x sub 1 dot, an x sub 2 dot, an x sub 3 dot, an x sub 4 dot. Can't go any lower, so it's a fourth order system. Okay. I can't see you anyway, I don't have my glasses on. But anyway.
this is now our state space representation. And how big is A dimensionally in this system that we just wrote down? It was a two by two, wasn't it? C was one by two, D was one by one, B was two by one. We will derive, or maybe you can do this for your roommate tonight, is you will find that if you Laplace transform that system of equations, you will find capital Y of S is C, SI minus A inverse B plus D times U of S, and this is our transfer function, capital G of S, that we started with and when we were talking about the block diagrams of our system. And now we have a transfer function associated with that circuit, that RC circuit. If you plug in the A's, the B's, the C's, and the D's, you can do that with your calculator. It will actually do the symbolic inverse with S, and you can quickly find, if you have the right calculator, I guess, you can find capital G of S. I believe we're out of time. We'll pick up at that point or somewhere close, but this gives you a feel for where we're starting, and now we're going to start running a little faster once we get going. Have a good holiday break. I know you'll be spending Sunday with napkins and transfer functions, so enjoy your weekend.